Good morning. I want to start today by uh, making a confession. I'm a ruminator. A ruminator is someone who thinks deeply about uh, a subject. Wanda will tell you that uh, I tend to turn the rock over 17 times uh, before I make a decision. And then once I make a decision, I'll turn it over uh, another 17 times to make sure that I made the right decision. Now, I think that that analysis is a wee bit um, exaggerated. I will admit that I tend to turn the rock over 15 times before I make a decision, and perhaps 12 times after I make the decision. And that is especially in the area of what I say to you on a Sunday morning. You see, I take what Paul says to us in our text today very seriously. Well, we're looking at chapter 14 of Paul's letter to the Roman church today. And in verse 10, or the second half of that verse, uh, 10, and then in verse 12, Paul writes these words. For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Now, this is not just the teaching of Paul. The writer to the Hebrews puts it this way in chapter 4, verse 13 of Hebrews. He, uh, the writer says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now this is a very consistent theme uh, throughout the Old and New Testament, all of the scriptures. God sees and hears everything. God knows our thoughts. Nothing is hidden from him. So, at some point, we have to give an account before God for our lives, how we lived our lives. Now, I think we all need to take this very seriously. I certainly do. For those of us who have accepted God's gospel, that is to say that we have come into relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible is not speaking of, nor is Paul, about our sins. They have been forgiven. And God says that he has forgotten them. But that is not the case for those who have rejected God's gospel. The Bible is very clear that God loves those people, that he grieves deeply over their rejection of his gospel, but they still stand in their sins. That is their personal choice, and God respects that choice. And per chapter 2 of Romans that we looked at several weeks ago, those folks will experience God's wrath, and punishment for sin throughout all of eternity. But the point is that we as Christ followers, as believers, will give an account for how we lived our lives as Christians. And that accountability is what, is, is what Paul is speaking about in chapter 14 of Romans. So understanding that, perhaps you can... Uh, uh, understand why I have this drive to think deeply about what I say to you uh, each Sunday morning. I have to give an account to God for my words. I'm very careful to present exactly what God says to us in his word, as accurately and as clearly as I can. I don't put a spin on it. I'm not giving you my uh, interpretation not my opinion. If I ever uh, express my opinion, I will clearly say, I'm not sure about this point, but this is what I think. I'm after what God says to us in his word. And of course, you can always read it for yourself. I have encouraged everyone, my whole ministry life, and certainly since I've been here in North Carolina, to read God's word for yourself because you're the one that's going to give an account for your life. I give an account for my life. So as we come to this chapter 14 of Paul's letter, he continues 
his teaching on practical Christian living. He's applying all of the propositional truth, all of the biblical truth that he has presented from the beginning of his letter. And his theme in chapter 14 is unity and acceptance among believers. Just like a couple of weeks ago, his theme was unity uh, within diversity. Unity as in believers all are part of God's family. And diversity in that each believer is giving, given a, uh, a unique spiritual gift. It's not a talent. It's not a skill. You don't go to school to learn about it. It's a spiritual gift that God gives to each believer. And it's unique to them. And it's meant to build up the family of God, to strengthen, uh, particularly, uh, you would say, the, the church family uh, that they worship in. Now, we need to remember that Paul's overarching goal in all of his teaching is that we, as Christ's followers, live lives in a practical sense in such a way that we reflect well on God and his family because we always represent God. We always re represent his family in every area of our lives. That's why last Sunday we saw Paul teach us in Romans 13 how we are to relate to proper uh, functioning governmental authority. And in thinking about what Paul taught us in chapter 13, uh, I, I want to draw your attention back to those uh, three verses, uh, 11 through 14. And you may remember that I said that those particular verses had a, um, an end times uh, perspective. That, that Paul wrote in what is known as an already not yet um, orientation. He's speaking about the kingdom of God, and already means that uh, the kingdom of God has come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus brought the kingdom of God. And that is, uh, let, let's just say, the kingdom of God is God's rule, the rule of uh, God's word in our lives on a daily basis. The not yet portion is referring to the fact that uh, uh, his kingdom is not here in its fullness. That is to say, you and I are still fallen, broken sinners. We're not perfect. We live in a fallen, broken world. And so God's kingdom is not going to be here in its fullness till Jesus comes back the second time when he will rule Honored in person. Well, understanding the already not yet concept helps us understand the whole of the New Testament because the entire New Testament is written with this orientation. The kingdom of God has come and it will come in its fullness when Jesus comes the second time. And so the admonition, the, the thrust of the teachings of the New Testament is that we live in such a way, very practically, that it prepares us for that event, the second coming of Jesus. Well, in our text today, chapter 14, there is another uh, biblical orientation, you might call, that helps us understand the New Testament. It's very important, and it has caused uh, uh, a, a lot of um, misunderstandings because we don't understand this or apply this correctly. And I'm speaking of something that is called uh, cultural relevance. Big fancy term. But it's very simple. Cultural relevance simply means that the author, as he writes his letter or his epistle, is writing to a specific church about a specific set of circumstances in a specific uh, point in history. But the issues that he's addressing may not be relevant to our day and time, the 21st century. And so while the specifics of the circumstances that he's writing about may not be uh, relevant, the spiritual truth that he offers as a remedy is. So let me il illustrate this point with the first 12 verses of chapter 14 of the book of Romans. 
Paul is expressing his thoughts on practical Christian living in these 12 verses through the topics of uh, diet or dietary practices, that is the food that people eat and the way it was prepared, and days given over to worship. Now, it's not hard to understand that these two topics come from uh, the tension in the Roman church between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. As we've gone through this whole letter, we've seen that this tension between these two major segments of the church, or uh, the church body, uh, has shaped all that Paul has been uh, teaching them um, as, as we've gone through this whole study. You see, the Jews thought of themselves as stronger or superior Christians uh, because they kept the Jewish religious traditions. Food, how it was prepared, and the Sabbath, the rules for keeping the Sabbath. They would insist that the Sabbath was on what we call Saturday. Technically, it would be from Friday night at 6 o'clock till Saturday night at 6 o'clock. But the Gentiles would have worshipped on what we call Sunday. And as we said, these 12 verses uh, in chapter 14, it would be very in, uh, easy for us as 21st century Christians, as we come to this portion, um, to uh, kind of smile and say, uh, this has nothing to do with me. Uh, we don't have those kind of issues in the 21st century. And so we might be tempted to slide over what Paul is talking about here and his remedy for these folks, and that would be a very grievous and unfortunate mistake. You see, because while we don't have, in the 21st century, we don't have the same issues that the folks did in Rome, we do have issues that provide conflict and division uh, within the, uh, the, the Christianity, a lack of unity. Remember, God's desire for us is unity within our diversity. You see, in our day, we have denominational distinctions, traditions that not all Christ followers think of as valuable. Some do, some don't. Uh, we have issues about worship styles. They're usually characterized as uh, a very traditional worship style, or a contemporary worship style, or, or even a blended, a mixture of both. Music that we sing, um, the instruments that we play in worship. There are many uh, issues that come, uh, that surround the, the, uh, the choice of which version of the scripture that we use uh, in worship. All of these differences have caused and are causing um, division, conflict within Christianity. And I, for one, think that this is a, uh, uh, brings great sadness to the heart of God. It is certainly not the unity that Jesus uh, prays about in John's Gospel, chapter 17. It's called his great priestly prayer on the night uh, that he was uh, uh, going to be arrested. And he's walking over to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and he stops and he prays. And uh, four times he very uh, powerfully prays uh, for unity amongst his followers, those in the first century and all those uh, that would follow after that. And, of course, he, being God, uh, was understanding that would be you and me. Well, Paul identifies these issues in verse 1 as disputable matters. They should not divide us. And Paul's teaching to the Roman church is just as applicable to us as it was to them. And so we should pay close attention to what Paul says and apply it in our lives uh, today. Now, as I said, Paul begins this chapter by talking about diet and what day is best for worship because of the tension that these two topics were bringing uh, in the church uh, in Rome in the first century. And Paul challenges uh, the Jewish criticism of the uh, Gentiles in verse 4. Listen as I read. Who are you to judge another man's servant? 
to his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now what I like here about what Paul is saying is he's reminding the folks in Rome, and he's reminding us that as believers, as members of God's family, we are all to be servants of Jesus Christ. We are all to serve his interest first, not our own. Not only, but first. God, our relationship with God and doing God's ministry, his work, his fulfilling his will always comes first. So as Paul teaches in verse 10, we are accountable to God, not other human beings. Now remember this whole passage, uh, the whole chapter, but certainly the first 12 verses we're looking at this morning, are qualified by that verse 1. Paul writes, Accept the person whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. And, of course, the key phrase there is, without passing judgment on disputable matters. These cultural differences, they're not life-threatening. Paul is not discussing, nor were the people in Rome uh, discussing or arguing about uh, central Christian issues, critical Christian truths, like, let's say, uh, the Trinity. Uh, the deity of Jesus Christ, that's an issue for, for some today. Uh, or, or the authority of the scriptures, that's also an issue for today. But they weren't discussing those kind of things. The Jews were fussing with the Gentiles because they, the Gentiles, would not follow the Jewish religious uh, traditions. And they wanted their traditions to be the standard for acceptance with God, with everybody, or for everybody. You see, they forgot that the standard for acceptance with God is one thing, faith in Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, this dynamic is not exclusive to the first century. It exists today in our world. People uh, insist that their denominational traditions are evidence of the fact that they are more mature Christians, that their form of worship is more reverent or, or more welcomed by God. Well, Paul's answer to those folks in Rome is still the right answer uh, for us in the 21st century. It works in both worlds. As he writes in verse 3, God has accepted him or her. The person that we think is doing something incorrectly. God is able to make him stand. So why do you judge your brother, he writes in verse 10, or look down on your brother? I love that word brother because he's writing to Jews and Gentiles and he's using an intimate word or form uh, that would indicate a family member. The point here that Paul is making that we need to make for ourselves is that we have freedom in Christ when it comes to issues of style of worship, the music that we sing, the food that we eat, or denominational traditions. These are cultural matters. Paul calls them disputable matters. They're not central truths of the gospel. They're not life-threatening. So don't major in the minors. Don't, don't seek things that divide the family of God because God's desire for us is unity. And Paul's appeal here is unity and acceptance of those that are different than we are. Now, I think it's important that we think about this very seriously. In fact, I could say, become a ruminator like me. Because this issue will become stronger as we move further into the 21st century and our future as Christians and uh, for our church here in Walla. Cultural matters could thwart or even stop our growing God's kingdom through our church here. And we should not let that happen. Unity and acceptance is God's desire for us. Let's pray.
Father God, we thank you that as your children, you have made us unique. You've given us different gifts, so we are different, and there are many styles and formats that bring, uh, that, that, uh, bring honor and glory to you that we need to major in the majors, not the minors. And once we do that and we accept those who are not like us, we live in love, as John says and Paul says, that we reflect well on you and your family. We pray that would be true of all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week.